Good day to you all. I'm really excited to be here today so I can explain to you more about my nine and a half tips for awesome visualizations in Power BI. First of all, I would like to thank Enterprise DNA for inviting me, for having me in this session. And second of all, I would like to thank you for joining me today. And uh, hopefully I can uh, give you some, uh, some tips. And in this case, I think they're very practical tips to improve your visualizations in Power BI. But uh, first, uh, short, uh, uh, my name is Michel Decker. I'm uh, the managing director of Nova Silva, and we build custom visuals, or like I prefer to say, we build visuals for Power BI. So in case you should ever miss a visual in Power BI, have a look, they're all in the app source. And uh, if you have any ideas, please contact us uh, so we can uh, continue to approve that. But hey, today I'm not going to talk about our visuals. Today I'm going to talk about visualization in general. And before we uh, kick it off, I'd like to start with uh, the following uh, image. I don't want to talk about the guy in front, uh, which is Max Verstappen, by the way. But I want to talk about the lady at the back. Well, let's start with her name. She's called Hannah Smith. You've probably never heard of her, but let's remember this name. Because what's the case with Hannah Smith? She's responsible within the racing team, the Red Bull team for um, analyzing all the data that comes in from the car, but also from the competitors, etc. So she is the head data analyst, let's call her like that. And why was she actually at the podium uh, after this race? Well, because uh, thanks to her, thanks to her decision, uh, Max Verstappen actually uh, won the race. And what happened? He was driving in the first position. She said he had to come in for new tires. He did. He dropped back to the third position. And during the race, because he had better tires than the rest, he actually won the race, and thanks to her. And why do I uh, like to bring uh, Hannah Smith uh, uh, when I talk about uh, data visualization? Well, the thing is that data itself doesn't create any meaning. Data in itself is just data. But we human beings can create that meaning. And the meaning is maybe the difference between just another data and real impact. And, and I think Hannah Smith is a very good example of this. So yes, she has great technology at her fingertips and she can use whatever she needs there, but in the end, she's a human being and needs to make a decision. And that's the reason why we need to make sure that our data visualizations are effective so that human beings can make good decisions. They can make the calls. The computer doesn't need a visualization. Eh? It's only for us. So let's optimize data visualizations for human consumption. I sometimes say, hear, hear this term, eh? information is beautiful. There's also actually a couple of very interesting, uh, impressive books about it. Uh, and therefore I brought with you this image. Eh? It's, a, it's a painting of Keith Haring, uh, which I actually like a lot. Uh, I don't know about you, but I, I think it's a very nice picture. Um, but there's also another artist, so not Keith Haring, and this artist uh, who's called Ursus Werley, he actually um, doesn't like these type of uh, paintings. He thinks it's, uh, it's a bit messy. Uh, and so he likes to clean up the artwork of others. And here you got uh, the image of Ursus Werley. Uh, same components as Keith Herring's painting, but he just organized them all by color and size. And again, if it's for aesthetic reasons, if it's for a nice picture, I understand why people prefer the right one. But most of the time, it's not for entertainment purposes that we build all these reports and dashboards. Most of the time, we want to make sense of the data. We need to get the data delivered in such a form that we human beings can make good decisions and don't uh, end up puzzling and figuring out why this visual looks like it does. So I would say almost for the boring part, uh, where we want to make decisions based on data, the Ursus Whaley approach is better. If you look for entertainment, the right one is better. And I think for most of our reports, we probably should more focus on the left-hand side. We want to make decisions. We want to get action in our organizations. Here on this schema, you can actually see how it works. So we get uh, a light coming in from uh, uh, in our eyes. And at the back of our eyes, we have all these receptors. And they will translate that, um, that light signal into an electric signal. It will go to the back of our head. And at the back of our head, we have... A part, of the, um, a part of the brain that's called the visual cortex. And like you see it here uh, uh, highlighted. And this visual cortex is really an awesome part of our brain. It basically decides whether it's something uh, it can uh, fix by itself. So is it something so easy, so basic it can fix by itself or whether it needs help from other parts of the brain. And believe me, if it can fix it by itself, if it can be done autonomously by the visual cortex, it's better for us. 
because we are faster. And I know speed in brain speeds is always a discussion. So therefore, I'd like to ask you to think about the following. How often in a 24 hour period does it become dark for you guys? Think about it. How often in 24 hours does it become dark? Some people will say one or two, but actually it's closer to 20,000. Because the blinking of our eye, every time we blink with our eyes, actually we don't see anything. But still, we don't notice that. Huh? Well, right now you, you probably do. Eh? Everybody's now blinking with his eyes and thinking about what's going on. Believe me, in five minutes you forgot all about it. Everything is back to normal. But think about it. Every time we blink our eyes, this visual cortex actually will filter this moment out. So we continuously have this feeling of we know where we are. We, we, we know where, eh, what we see around us. And we don't have this blinking effect all the time. And that's thanks to this visual cortex. But still, this is a lot of theory and whatsoever. So let's make it even more practical. Let's do a little test. And um, I brought with me a little test. What will happen actually is that besides what's now on the screen, which is a lot of white and a, lot of, a couple of words, but there will be more objects coming onto the screen. So I'll, I'll count down, three, two, one, press a button, then the things appear on the screen, and then it disappears again very fast. My uh, uh, question to you guys is, have a look, be concentrated, and try to tell me how many of the squares that will appear, some of them are blue, some of them are red, how many of them are red? And simply shout out the number when you have that, okay? So there we go. Three, two, one. That was fast, huh? I couldn't really hear what you were saying, but uh, I assume that most of you were at three, two or four, something like that. And so most of you probably have, uh, have seen this. And I think the great majority of everybody who sees this test thinks, okay, this was an easy thing to do. But if you really think about it, this is pretty impressive. There are so many objects and the, and the individual cortex who can do this all by himself. Look at it, they've detected these three. Okay, so, so we did this first test, let's do another one. And this time, all the objects that will appear will all be blue. But some of them are circles and most of them are squares. And I simply want to know from you guys, how many circles do you see there? So again, ignore everything that's already on the screen. It's only what will appear and disappear again. I'll count down, it comes up, it disappears and shout it out. Let everybody around you hear how many circles do you think are there? Here we go, three, two, one. Hey, how was that? The right answer actually is four. Um, again, I think lots of you have, uh, have uh, had that uh, correct answer. Maybe you were one off. Okay, that's fine as well. One thing's for sure, even if the rest of the training doesn't give you any, ten any, any tangible results, you can tell everybody right now that your visual cortex is working perfectly. Yeah, so if you're spot on or one, or, uh, or one off, you're fine. There's nothing uh, to worry about. But I do notice that most people find the second exercise a bit more difficult. So the red squares was easier than the blue circles. But okay, let's, uh, let's uh, do one more because hey, uh, we're still at it. So let's do one more. And here you go. Uh, at this time, you'll have squares and circles. You'll have red and blue objects. And I want to know how many blue circles. Ignore everything else, only blue circles. Yeah, here we go again. Three, two, one. All right, this was tough, wasn't it? Let me show you the answer. Um, most people that uh, do this test uh, fail at the last one. And isn't that crazy? So both color and form are forms in our surrounding that the uh, visual cortex can process by itself. They're so-called pre-attentive attributes. So these things in our surroundings, the visual cortex can recognize all by themselves. Really powerful. But in the last example, in the blue circle example that you know on the screen, actually I combined the two of them. I combined form and color. And there we saw that suddenly it became less powerful. Yeah. And maybe some people uh, had the right answer, but if I would have asked you, how sure are you that it is four? then still a lot of people would uh, probably uh, tell me that they're not really sure. It's actually a very difficult exercise, the last one. And okay, uh, I did it on purpose, sorry for that. 
But there you see that there is these pre-attentive attributes and color is maybe one of the most powerful we have there. Uh, and the thing is, it's very powerful, but we need to use it with care. The moment you start overusing it, it's way too much and it's simply an overload. And in this case, your visual cortex couldn't solve it and ask your short-term memory for help. But short-term memory came back and said, uh, you know how many objects were there? There were may way more than four or five, so I can simply not count them all. So, uh, sorry, can't help you this time. And there you go. And therefore, most of us are probably not able to really, for sure, count these four blue circles. Okay. Enough testing. Your visual cortex works fine, but let's go to the visualization because that's uh, the reason why we're all together today. So let's go for the nine and a half tips of awesome visualizations in Power BI. And, uh, and let's start with the first one. And uh, the first one uh, is the winner. I, uh, I hear lots of people having discussions, not only um, in real life, but also online about what's the best data visualization, which chart or which table is better than the other. And I'd like to do that exercise with you guys as well. And again, here you have um, four visualizations. Uh, by the way, I think a table is also a data visualization. So here you have four visualizations. On the top left, you see a table. Very important visualization that we have. On the top right, we actually see what I call a lipstick chart. So it's a bar chart, one in front of the other. The back uh, bar is a bit uh, broader than the front bar and it looks like a lipstick, and the lipstick bar is there. On the bottom left, we see a deviation chart that expresses the, the difference between the two series as a percentage, and on the bottom right, we see another deviation chart that shows a difference in absolute numbers, in this case, in US dollars. So we've got four different ways of showing or displaying or visualizing exactly the same data. And now my question to you guys is, Okay, which of these four is the best? Which of these four is the best visual for you? Maybe you're struggling, maybe you have a very strong personal preference. Um, I have to admit that uh, it's a very uh, nasty question for me to ask for a best, because uh, I don't know if you already uh, felt it, but there is no best. Because there's no way you can decide for the best data visualization if you have no clue what you're trying to achieve. If you don't know which question we're trying to answer, which data question are we trying to answer, it's impossible to select the best data visualization. Simply based on the data that's there, it's not possible. And uh, so be very careful when people ask you for the best data visualization. It always depends on the context and where you're gonna use it. And without that context, it's an impossible mission. So yes, I ask you for it, but again, sorry for that, trying to deceive you a bit, but uh, they're A, B, C, or D, they're all right, they're all wrong. Um, you can't answer it correctly without knowing which questions you're trying to answer. And that brings me directly to point two, start with why. In my perspective, every report or every dashboard is the answer to one or multiple questions. And these questions is your starting point for deciding how to design and build a report or a dashboard. You don't know the why, there's no way to start. And I come across a lot of people who say, I don't know why we're building this. My boss asked for it and they told me they need it by tomorrow. So I'll do it. But this is a very unfortunate way to work with it. Because basically, if we don't know the why, yeah, so if we don't know the question, how do we know if the answer is right? Very difficult thing to do. And therefore I bring uh, Alex Trebek with me. I don't know if you know it, the game Jeopardy. Very big in the US, at least it was very big in the US. Not very big in Europe, I must say. Uh, most people here in Europe, uh, they know about the game, but they've never uh, seen it. The reason why I uh, bring uh, Alex Trebek to this training or the, to this session is that the game Jeopardy is all about you get the answer to the question and you need to guess the question. And my question is, to a lot of people building reports and dashboards, why do we play this game all day? Even if you don't know it, we have never, I've never seen an organization with a lack of reports or dashboards. I don't know how big your organizations are, but if they are, if they are of some sensible size, you probably never had a lack of reports or dashboard. They're everywhere. But if you ask people, do they have enough insight to make the right decisions, then silence kicks in. So apparently 
we have too many reports and dashboards, but not enough insights. And I think one of the reasons is that we don't start with why. And so we need to ask these questions because our audience will always start everything they see for the first time with two questions in their mind. What is this? And what can I do with this? Eh? Is this for me or not? We're all busy. Our inbox is exploding. So we have all these other things that we also need to take care of. So be careful there. Think about the why before you start building. There's no, it doesn't make any sense to start before that. Okay, let's go to three. And um, point three, don't make me think. Again, it's not that I don't want people to think about uh, the consequences of what the data is trying to tell us. What I want to avoid is that people need to use a huge amount of effort in their brains to understand what the visual is trying to tell them. And to do so, I'll, I'll show you the example. This is a, actually a chart I came across way back when, which was on a dashboard of a, uh, of a pretty big organization. And as you can see here in the orange line, there is like this target of uh, 70 million euros um, that they wanted to uh, get to at the end of the year. That was their sales target. And uh, that's the orange line. And you see on the X axis, these are the weeks of the year. So this is an organization that likes to uh, look at the year uh, week by week. And the blue line is actually the actual revenue of that year. And as you can see, this organization didn't make it in this year. So they didn't get to the target. Okay, so that's clear. That's all in this chart. But now the th next thing happens is that uh, when I uh, came across this chart for the first time, the, the management team that was seeing this on the dashboard, they were telling me that they saw this pattern year over year over year coming back. And the pattern they explained to me was uh, uh, during the year, the distance between the revenue and the target becomes bigger. So our problem grows during the year. That was the conclusion they draw, drew from this, uh, this image. Which is strange, as some of you might already think, mm, that's fishy, isn't it? And yes, I can understand why they are saying it, because there's more white pixels between the target and the revenue line in the last week than there is in the first week. That's clear. So the funny thing is that this visual, this chart, which is a basic line chart with commutative numbers, gives us the wrong signal. Because the signal it provides us is that the problem gets bigger, the distance between the, line, the two lines gets bigger. But if you really look close at the data, that's not what's happening. And in this case, it's impossible. This, this way of showing the data, it makes it impossible. So let's have a look at another way. Here you go. So we have the same data, but in this case, we said, okay, you know what? The target line is flat on the X axis. And we show the revenue as a difference between the target and the actual revenue. So here you see in this chart that in week one, we were close to 40% below the target. But if you go all through the whole year, and in the end of the year, what do you see? We're about 20%. So still there is a problem. I, I didn't uh, magically make the problem go away, but still it is different. So we start with minus 40 and we end up with minus 20. So the problem doesn't get bigger. No, no, it's the other way around. The problem gets smaller. And this is what the data is trying to tell us. But in the original image that we were using, it was simply hiding this because we are showing this as what they call indirect measures. And so we are expecting the audience to do the calculation in their head, which is always a bad choice. So if you show two numbers because you want people to think about the difference, in this case, whether we are above or below and how much above or below are we compared to the target, calculate it for them, show it to them. And maybe not replacing the first with the second chart, but maybe adding the second chart, because I see the first chart everywhere. The second one, very scarce. I don't see it very often. So show people direct measures where they don't have to do any calculations or whatsoever. Make it clear for them. Let's go to four. I don't know what it is, but I see a lot of dashboards who are completely focused on comparing two data points. So only this number with the number of last month or something similar, which is a bit strange. And, um, and the, the strange thing is we as human beings are very strong at detecting patterns. I don't know uh, what you're seeing here, but this actually looks like a, a piece of art. And uh, this, is, uh, this is made by Chris Jordan and uh, it's called uh, uh, Portraits of Global Mass Culture. 
uh, from 2009 actually. Um, and uh, so it's a pretty new piece. Uh, it looks older if you look at it for the first time. And what's so funny about this piece is that uh, it's not painted. It's actually composed out of a huge amount of plastic bags. And the huge amount is 240,000. So Chris Jordan used 240,000 plastic bags to create this piece of art. And why did he use 240,000 plastic bags? Well, for a reason, because that's equal to the estimated number of plastic bags consumed around the world every 10 seconds. So every 10 seconds, we consume 240,000 plastic bags. Wow. And Chris uh, Jordan wants to make us aware how much plastic bags we're throwing away, how much plastic bags we're consuming. And he made this very nice data art with it. And the funny thing is, if we look at it from a distance, we see a nice picture. We see a nice image because we are looking at these patterns. Well, okay, let's go to dashboards then. I see this very often coming up. Eh? So uh, on the dashboard, there's like this KPI indicator. And in this case, it says, okay, 24,000 case. And, um, oh, sorry, 24,000. And it's 50% uh, below something. Yeah? Because what happens here, and let me draw it. So yes, we have this 24,000 K. Uh, apparently we compared it to some other uh, period in time where it was 48,000. So we have 24,000 which we compare to another number, which is 48,000. And yes, the difference between 48 and 24 is about 50%. Yeah, so that's what they're standing at. But the funny thing is, is this, this is what I call a comparison of data points, two points, whether it's this uh, result with last month of the same period last year or whatsoever. And these point comparison are absolutely useless. We use them all the day. I see all reports and dashboards filled with them, but they don't make any sense because we do a lot of assumptions about the point we're comparing with. In this case, the 48K, what's so special about that number? Well, we're comparing with it. Maybe this is last month, huh? but maybe last month was the best month ever. And we go down a bit again. Is that a problem? Maybe not. But then again, hey, if uh, 48K uh, uh, was a normal month, then maybe there's a problem. So the problem here is that if you make a, a comparison of two data points, you actually assume a lot of the point you're comparing with. And let's draw the rest of the data points there as well. And as you can see, indeed, it was an exceptional high uh, uh, data point there. And the funny thing is, we have all the mechanisms in place to make sure that we don't use these point comparisons. But for one reason or the other, we always forget about them. And a very good example, and actually uh, recently added to Power BI, and recently I mean this year, is the addition of sparklines. And so we can have sparklines, which is a way better uh, form to compare to the past. Instead of simply comparing one single data point, we actually can compare to a whole series in a small chart, in this case in a line or in a bar chart. And that's a way better comparison than simply saying, let's compare this number with the com uh, number of last month. So we have all the mechanisms in place in uh, Power BI to make use of it. If you wanna go even a step further than this, because the question that always rises, if you have a higher number or you have a lower number, how bad is that? How bad is it to have a higher or a lower number? And the funny thing is for years now, I can say for decades, there's great technology, and it's all technology which you can also do on paper, to detect signals, to make a distinction between noise, all data by definition is a noise, and if you're lucky, there are signals in it. And the way to do it, there's a chart type which actually does that, which is a line chart that actually detects when is a data point a, a, a normal variation, and when is there something exceptional going on? And in this case, hey, this is a test data set, you see all these red marked data punch points, these are all exceptional changes. There's a couple of statistical rules that need to be applied there. But the funny thing is that these kind of charts, process control charts are basically uh, their name, or XMR charts, they're also called, um, they do that already for you. There's some very basic statistics behind it. You don't need to study anything for it. Both of these charts do it for you. If you want to make, know more, if you want to stop continuously managing your organization on noise and you want to move it and go to the real signals, 
then I would like to suggest you to uh, look at these two books of uh, Mr. Donald Wheeler. These are great, excellent written books. You don't need to be a statistician to understand them and uh, great material to learn more about it. Uh, the book on the front, uh, the Understanding Variation, that's uh, very accessible uh, also physically to get the book. The book at the back, Making Sense of Data, is actually an even better book, very hard to get a copy of. Or let me make that clear. It's not difficult to get a copy, but a copy with a sensible price, yes. I've seen people spending hundreds of dollars to get that single book, which is, by the way, already an old book. It's from the beginning of this century. But uh, if you can get your hands on it, get it there, because this is really a great book to make sense of data. And it talks very extensively about these control charts, process control charts or XMR charts. And also in Power BI, we have them. Eh? So there's no excuse for not using them. Okay, let's go to five. And uh, five is uh, comparing uh, two numbers with each other, apples to oranges, like, uh, like we say. And uh, let me uh, show you an example. Here you go, here we have a, a chart from uh, Power BI. And you see here on the y-axis, we have apparently a couple of uh, um, categories, corporate, home office, consumer, and small business. And we have some numbers uh, there. And apparently this is uh, the total sales per customer segment. Huh? So the categories are customer segments and the numbers there are uh, sales. And what's wrong in this chart? Well, this chart type is a lollipop chart, very similar to a bar chart, by the way. And both bar charts and lollipop charts, they have something in common, and it's that they use length to encode data. And whenever you use length or surface to encode data, so if you use length or surface to show your data, you have to apply with one specific rule, and that's always start your numeric axis in zero. Here, the axes start in 300K. So the differences look bigger than they actually are. If you have such a situation, you simply need to make sure that you always start in zero, like you see here on the second image. The second image is the same as the first one. The only difference is it starts in zero. So whenever you have a bar chart, it always starts in zero. And the same applies for uh, the lollipop, which again is a similar thing. You have length to encode data whenever it's length, or surface always start in zero. And so let's be clear, it only applies for bars or, or lollipops. It doesn't apply to all chart types. So it's not like you always need to start in zero, but if you do start in something else than zero, make sure you're not using length to understand how big or small a number is. All right, let's go to six. And, uh, and six is about uncertainty. I sometimes get the feeling that uh, people want to have easy dashboards. Just give me a dashboard with one number that I can act on. I, I sometimes hear these comments go around. And, and here I've got an example uh, that I came across uh, recently. So uh, this is uh, of a, uh, an organization that stores a lot of material in their warehouses. And here you see the orange line, which is the capacity of the warehouses, just above 60,000. Uh, so that's the maximum capacity of the warehouses. And then you see the blue, the blue line, and it's a, a blue line is a result of the stock level per month. But obviously, if you think about it, stock levels happen every day. So this is probably something like an average, yeah, maybe a mean or a median or whatsoever. And as you can see, the, the stock level is clearly below the capacity of the warehouses. So the, the chart here shows no problem at all. But let me bring in some additional elements in this chart. Here, this light blue area is actually the maximum and the minimum capacity being used in the warehouses. And there you see that in every single month, there are periods where we use more space than our capacity, which is tough, by the way, in a warehouse. So apparently, we have a huge capacity problem. But if we all bring it down to something so simple as an average or a mean or a median, we might be looking at the wrong side. This organization was thinking we have enough capacity. I don't know why everybody's complaining that we have so many boxes lying around everywhere. No, they have a problem, but their chart was simply not showing it. And the funny thing is, again, recently in Power BI, this option has been added. Eh? It's called error bars. Here it's not looking like a bar, it's more like an area, but again, it's an, uh, a formatting option in there. So in the line charts in Power BI, you can simply use the error bars. And, and I would almost say, 
if you calculate an average to uh, communicate, make sure you don't forget about the uncertainty or about the min and the max, the, the bandwidth of values, because they tell us a lot about the data and we cannot simply ignore them. All right, seven. We've already seen in a little test in the beginning that color is very fundamental. So we need to be very thoughtful of using color. Unfortunately, I see a lot of reports and dashboards looking like this. I simply uh, Googled uh, around, show me a dashboard in Power BI, and uh, I came across a company that showed this on their website. Um, and I, I actually believe they were pretty proud of this picture. Um, so therefore I removed their logo and it now says company logo because I'm not here to, uh, to damage anyone there. But this is not a good dashboard. This is a horrible dashboard. If you see this for the first time, your eyes go everywhere. Everything shouts at you. Everything is trying to grab your attention. With the end result, you have no clue what you're looking at. Um, color is a very powerful element that we have, but we need to be very careful in using it. Let's be very um, careful when we apply color. And if you make two things the same color, make sure they mean the same thing. Or like uh, a good friend of mine uh, uh, always says to me, your new favorite color is gray. So if you're working in dashboard design or report design, gray is a great color to make things, they're there, but they don't shout for any attention. And let's be honest, we need to be more careful. What is important and what's not, and apply color very selectively to the important parts and apply very neutral colors like gray to the less important parts, but still necessary. And we can't remove everything in that sense. All right, number eight. Some people ask me, is that your dog? No, sorry guys, that's not my dog, but uh, I feel almost a pity for this dog when I look at him. Oh, poor little dog. But again, uh, I wanna talk, not talk about this uh, very funny dog. I wanna talk about themes, themes in Power BI. And most of you probably have already seen them. Eh? So uh, I've got uh, this uh, chart in Power BI and apparently I've got this color scheme applied to it. And if I now change themes, then that same chart will look differently. Great. I'm not saying, by the way, that these uh, two charts are uh, displayed in the correct way. Too many colors for me, uh, for my uh, pref preference. But again, this is what most people know themes for. But actually, there's even more power in themes. The only downside is that you need to do a little bit of technology work. It's a little bit. It's not really, it, it doesn't, uh, you only need to become a programmer if that's uh, what worries you. And, uh, and that's that every theme in Power BI in the end, whatever you can do with the interface, in the end is a JSON file. And if you've never seen a JSON file, you don't know what a JSON file is. At the end, it's simply a text file. It's a text file where you can specify lots of things in. And obviously you can select colors. Uh, here I've got an example of, uh, of such a, a theme. So yes, you can uh, define which colors you want to use, in this case in a hex code. So you need to look up the co uh, codes and then specify them here. But the funny thing is, everything you set in the formatting pane of the visuals can also be set in the JSON files. So if you feel like you're setting, you're changing the default settings of your visuals every time over and over again, again, the same way that you will add to get them in the right form, it, it's time to go and have a look at these theme files. It will save you a huge amount of time and it will become better. So create a solid theme file to uh, support all the standard settings that you want to. And believe me, if you do that, your reports and dashboard will look more the same. It will be more like a corporate uh, identity that you can in include there, but also avoid uh, typical mistakes like having your bar chart start in zero and those kind of things, all things you can set in here. Um, if you, by the way, are gonna do this, um, I would say uh, that uh, the, the biggest challenge with these JSON files is that you have a lot of brackets. And if you only miss one, suddenly the file doesn't work anymore. So when you start working with it, make sure you save it a lot of times. And the other thing is get yourself a good editor to do this. And uh, the one you see here on the screenshot is uh, Notepad++. Notepad++. It's a free uh, download. You can download it uh, for free and it works excellent. So make your JSON files with that and it actually will help you detect if you make uh, some mistakes. So as I said, get yourself a good um, editor and uh, save uh, very often to make sure that you don't uh, lose a working JSON file. But believe me, this will make your life a lot easier when you build reports and dashboards. Let's go to mine. 
and nine is all about layout. Layout is fundamental. And uh, let, let's have a look at, uh, I've, I've got, uh, I, I took this from a, from a dashboard. And uh, if you look at this dashboard, well, first of all, there's lots of information here. Yeah, so some people say this is too much, it's too crowded. Okay. I, I think I understand what people are saying here, but there's even something even worse than the amount of data. And that's the thing that this dashboard, the elements on the dashboard are not aligned. They're everywhere. Yeah, so there's no, no clear structure. There's no grid structure visible that will actually help us. And the thing is, if you want to help people to uh, look at things and to um, detect the real signals, you need to give them something they can understand. And the grid is a very important part of it. So if I reorganize everything you see here on the screen, only reorganize, I leave everything on there, to this image, I hope you all agree that this looks better. It's not that crammed together. Still, there's lots of information, I agree. But the thing that we did here is that we actually applied a grid, a very clear grid with three columns and three rows. And believe me, if you stick to these type of grids, and again, it doesn't always have to be three by three, it can also be two by four or four by two or whatsoever. But if you create these grids and you make sure that all your elements stick to the grid, believe me, it will be easier to read, easier to consume, easier to work with. But how do you do grids? How do you do layout in Power BI? Well, the support in Power BI is not always that strong, but there is a very interesting trick for it. And uh, let's have a look at uh, how that works. So the first thing you should do is whenever you start a new report or a new, uh, a new dashboard, is that you get yourself a shape, which is basically a bar. In this case, I simply draw one single bar in Power BI. And once I have drawn this bar, and this bar will actually be the width of the space between my elements. It's called the gutter. So this is the space that I will uh, respect between all my images and uh, um, uh, dashboard elements or whatsoever. And since I want to have multiple columns, I will copy this bar a couple of times. And there I've got all my uh, uh, different uh, gutters ready to go. The next thing I'll do is that I'll move one of these lines all the way to the right. So let's do that. There you go. And now, uh, once I've done that, I can actually ask Power BI to distribute all these lines evenly. Uh, there's a function for that. And if you do that, distribute horizontally of these lines, now suddenly we have three columns. Three identical width columns. Yeah? And obviously, we don't do this only for, uh, for the columns. We're also going to do this for the rows. So let's assume that uh, the top row uh, I want to have a bit different. So I've got a, a not too high uh, top row, but the other uh, rows, uh, the two ones, uh, the two be below there, I want to have them uh, evenly uh, spaced. So again, I do the same thing. I drag um, uh, the bar to the bottom and I distribute vertically in this case. And there you go. There we have our grid. And the funny thing is, if you now save this, if you save these bars as a group in Power BI, you'll see that everything you put on your dashboard or report will actually click onto the space, eh, the white space in this case, that you have there. Um, so everything is arranged. And obviously before you publish your report, make sure you hide the grid because the grid doesn't need to be visible. And there you go, all your visuals will be perfectly aligned like you see in this example. And again, I still agree, there's lots of things going on here, but the alignment makes it work. If for whatever reason, like in this case, the amount of data might be a bit challenging, maybe yeah, we, we probably need a bit more white space between the elements here, but I don't have that space. Then there is space to do, let's say the escape. And the escape in this case is add a very subtle line to separate out the elements and that's it. All right. Hey, and when I do this nine and a half tips, uh, I often get to the comment, oh, the half tip, how about that? Well, we, we have reached the point that we have to talk about the half tip. And the half tip is nothing about in concrete about Power BI itself, but it's all about how to design good data visualizations. And the secret there has nothing to do with technology. It has all to do with sketching. Get yourself a pencil and white sheets of paper so the lowest tech thing you can have and start with drawing. And believe me, your visualizations will get better. 
and I understand we're not going to build our reports with a pencil every month when we need to show the monthly reports. No, we will implement them in Power BI. I understand that. But for the design phase, it's fundamental to use a pencil and white paper. And believe me, you'll see that, first of all, your meetings will get better. Nobody will be impressed or, or um, 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 having difficulty with any technology. It will simply make sure that people can work together on designing good data visualizations. And having knowledge about what you can and can't do in Power BI obviously is very important, but start sketching. And the argument, I don't know how to draw, believe me, I don't either. I don't know how to draw, but believe me, everybody can draw a chart. Everybody can draw a bar chart or a line chart. And it's not for drawing perfectly. It's for putting the ideas you have in your head onto paper. This is the first test. And believe me, the almost all of the dashboards and reports I design, I draw first, and most of them never get built. Maybe I'm such a lousy drawer that nobody wants them, but I actually think it's something different. I actually think that I avoid having another report built where the audience says, nah, not exactly what I expected. And there we have another report to add to the stockpile of uh, reports nobody ever uses. Let's be honest. A report that's not being used is the most expensive, wasted time report we ever can. So draw faster, earlier in the process, and believe me, and experiment, and you'll be there. Okay, I'll have to wrap up. And uh, I always like to uh, bring along this, uh, this statement from uh, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. I don't know how to pronounce it well. My French is very bad. But actually, it's the author of The Little Prince. And he says, you know, you've achieved perfection in design, not when you have nothing more to add, but when you have nothing more to take away. Let's stop filling every little piece of white space with additional visuals or additional tables or additional numbers. Stop there. Get clear what the why is, why you're building your reported dashboard. And when the answer is there, you're done. White space is not your enemy. So again, remove things from your reports and dashboards until you hit the essence. You do one step back and you have your reported dashboard. And uh, the, the little rabbit on the left is actually Miffy. I don't know if you, uh, if you know her, but uh, uh, Miffy is actually uh, drawn by, uh, by a, a Dutch uh, artist. And uh, the funny thing about this uh, rabbit is that if you take away any line or any detail, it's not Miffy anymore. So Miffy, I would say, is the symbol of perfection because you can't take anything away because then the essence goes away. So Miffy is my symbol, my mascot of a perfect uh, design dashboard or report. So I would like to ask you all to have a bit more of Miffy in your life. And then reports and dashboards will get better and we will be able to act better on our data.